Let's go, man. God is good. Amen. We gave away, uh, we had about 2,000 people there. I would say maybe a little more. Some people are saying more. But, man, we gave away thousands of backpacks, thousands of free items of food. Uh, we couldn't have done that without many of our partners. Uh, Miami-Dade College was huge in this. They came along with the finances of this. I told them we don't have the money, but we got the manpower. Amen. Come on, somebody. And so we were able to come with them and help put this on. Uh, just so you all know, they actually gave us, now I'm going to be transparent 100% here. They gave us, I didn't know this, but when we were putting this on for them. They paid us $8,000 to put it on. Now, I want you to know, they told, I was like, what do you want me to do with this? We're a church. We don't work for money. We work for Jesus, right? And they're like, well, I don't give it to your staff. Do whatever. Take a raise, right? We're like, No. So what did we do? We took the 8000 they gave us, and we put it back into the event yesterday. And so we were able to get more backpacks. That's why we had so many backpacks. So we were able to take that money and put it right back into our community because that's our heart at Village Church. Come on, somebody. We don't keep it for ourselves. We give it back. We were able to get 1,000 extra backpacks, more school supplies. We were able to give away two bikes, VR sets, all kind of stuff because of that. So it was such an incredible opportunity to share with our community. Thank you all who came out to serve. Village Church showed up. Man, that was great. Uh, man, I'm just still, not only am I tired, but I'm ecstatic at the same time. So that's dangerous when you got an ADD, tired, ecstatic, happy person. I'm just saying, it gets wild in here. So we're starting a new series today called The Bible Paradox. So oftentimes when we read the Bible, we'll hear certain things that just don't make sense. When we say, man, the first shall be last, it sounds like a paradox. Now, if you know what a paradox is... It's a statement that seems to contradict itself, meaning uh, many of you have heard of icy hot, right? You put it on your elbow when it's hurting. Well, icy hot seems to contradict itself, right? So what we're doing over the next several weeks is we're going to talk about some of these paradoxes that we find in the Bible. And so today we're going to be in Luke chapter 6. If you have a Bible, if, uh, if not, it'll be on the screen. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 6, and I'm going to read this to you. Uh, this is the verses... Luke 6, starting in verse 27, this is one of the paradoxes that we're going to be talking about. And this is what Jesus says to his disciples and to those that are listening, and even uh, to the future generations, meaning us. He says this, but to you who are listening, that's us, I say, love your enemies. Bless those, or do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. All right, I'm talking today on something tough, but it's the paradox of love. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God to just bless our opportunity here and, and invite him into this moment. So, Father, I just ask right now, God, as we move forward into this sermon, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross, Father, that it would be your words and not mine. Lord, speak through me. Lord, eliminate distractions. Allow us to hear your voice. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was uh, in high school, I was at a friend's house one night, and it was a couple of buddies of mine. We were getting together, and we are having a bonfire, because where I'm from, you pretty much, that's all you got, right? Empty land. So when you want to do something fun, we're like, let's light a fire. That's just what happens from when you're from South Carolina. So uh, we're having a bonfire, and one of my friends gets this idea. We're like, you know, it's a little, the wood's a little bit wet. It's kind of cold, and we're like, let's throw some gasoline on the fire, right? We, we've done that. I mean, hope maybe not, but I have. And so we're standing there, and we're like, yo, hey, go grab some gasoline, throw it up on the fire. He's like, all right. So he, he starts tossing on there, and y'all know what it does. It starts getting bigger and bigger. And I'm not saying what we were drinking, but the water we had wasn't making us think smart. Some of y'all get that later. But what I'm saying is they just got more fun and more fun, right? Next thing you know, we're just, he's dumping, he's dumping, he's dumping. And it's like this fire is just getting bigger and bigger. And then, you know, it go down, and then he's dumping, and it gets bigger. And I, one time, out of nowhere, he, he's like kind of holding it for a little bit too long, and the fire shoots up into the can. And we're like, whoa! Like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, my gosh! Oh, my gosh! And, like, the fire's just kind of like shooting out of the can. We're like, dude, throw it! Now... Let me just put a little scenario here because imagine you're holding a can of fire. <laughs> to my backside is full woods. Over here, field. 
Short grass, wet, good spot. He's like, ah, shoot. This is real. I'm not even making it. Threw this thing into the woods, and the thing's spinning, and fire's just shooting out. Choo, choo, choo. And we're like, dude, like, we're going to go to jail. So we run out, right? No, we didn't run away. We went to the fire, and we start stomping things. Luckily, the fire didn't get up into the gas thing and blow it up, praise God. Uh, but as we threw it, all the, you just see you just see fire trembling, and you see burn marks. And we're going through, and we're like, oh, we got to put all these things out. And I begin to think about what Jesus is saying here. And in reality, when he's saying to love your enemies, what he's telling us not to do is to put gasoline on a fire that already exists. Come on, somebody. He's telling us, he says, love your enemies. Why? Because there's already a fire and gasoline does not need to be poured on. And when hate leads with hate, guess what? You're just adding fuel to the fire. If we recognize our place in this world as being redeemed out of the world and those that are still in the world, then we know that they are already on fire. They lead with fire. They lead with fury. They don't lead with love. They don't lead with Jesus. And so if there's already a fire there, Jesus is telling our disciples, we're not to be like we are. We don't need to go and pour gasoline on what's already lit. So what does that mean for us? If we're not to pour gasoline on it, if we're not to respond like they respond, what do we do? Well, Jesus says something that's countercultural in this moment. It's even hard for us because what I'm preaching today is going to hit the lives of many of us, myself included, because we all deal with this. So what does Jesus say? He, he stops one day, he's preaching, and his disciples had already had some issues with, with uh, the Pharisees, and all of a sudden Jesus stops, and he looks at his disciples and, and the people around us, and he says these words, to you who are listening. This is very important when you're reading the Bible. If you see Jesus ever say, truly, truly, I tell you. Or if you see him say, the, to those who are listening, he's not speaking just to the ones around. He's saying, to those who hear my word, apply it here and in the future. He's basically speaking to us. He's saying, hey, anybody that's willing to listen to what I say, I'm going to lead you to life. Anybody that doesn't, you're going to naturally lead yourself to death. So what is he saying here? He's saying, I need you, if you want it, those that hear me, listen Love your enemies. Now, Jesus is telling us something. He's saying, guess what? You're going to have enemies. That's hard for us to believe sometimes. We're going to have enemies. Jesus says, look, there are going to be people in this world that are going to oppose you. But your job is not to retaliate with the same opposition. So what do we do? He says, well, I want you to love your enemies. Okay, how do we do that? Well, what does he say? He says, well, first of all, I want you to do good to those who hate you. If you're taking notes, you can write it. He says, do good to those who hate you. Now, what does that mean? Jesus is telling us something. Guess what? People might not like you. That's hard for some of us to believe. I'm just saying. You know people don't like your pastor? That's real. Some, my wife's like, amen. You know, some people don't. That's hard for me to believe too, church. I know. I'm like, I'm a pretty nice guy. I don't know why they don't like me. But, you know, there's some people that don't like me. There's some people that don't like you. Jesus is telling us, hey, in this world, you are going to experience people that don't like you. They're going to operate with hate towards you. He's letting us know. He's setting us up to say, hey, when this happens, don't be shocked. Some of us are so shocked because we do such good things and we're nice and we're this and we're that. And we're like, well, why do they hate us? It's not you, it's them. Most of the time their hatred for themselves bleeds out of them onto you. So it's not so much that they hate you as much as they really hate the situation that they're in. But you're going to have people in this world that don't like you. And the best thing for us to understand is that it's not our job to get them to like us. That's not your job. I'm going to be 100%. I've pissed a lot of people off leading them to Jesus. Some of you are mad I said that word, but hopefully you get Jesus. 
I'm just saying, I, I, it's not up to us to make them like us. Some of us spend our time and our life like, well, I got, they hate me. I need to make them like me. I got I to figure this out. No, Jesus says, guess what? Some people are going to hate you. But your job's not to go hate them back. What do we do when they hate you? Just do good for them. Just do good to them. You know what I love to do? It makes my wife so, I don't want to say angry, but it bothers her. It bothers her. There are literally people that just don't like me. There are people here in the city that do not like me. I know it's shocking. We're all shocked. I know. We're like, what? How? But when I see these people, and people are sometimes like, oh, there's such and such. They, you know, they hate. They don't like John Michael. You know what I do? Hey! How are you? Gosh, I missed you so much. Give me a hug. Oh, I love you. And they're so confused. They're just like, why is he? I don't understand. He knows I said all this. Yeah, I do, but I love you. It doesn't matter. How are you? Because you know what that does to the enemy when you pour this niceness? The Bible says it's like heaping burning coals on their head. They don't understand it. They're like, but I've, I've said this. I've done this. I've done this. Why are you approaching me? Why are you coming to me? Why are you saying this? I don't understand that. Well, of course they don't because there are certain levels of immaturity in life. And even though they hate you, the difference is you might be just a little bit more mature in your life and in your walk with Jesus to look past their hatred and to see what? The Bible. And what the Bible says, it doesn't matter how they feel about me, what they do to me, I am supposed to do good to you. There are some people out there that don't like you. You know what the best thing for you to do next time you see them? Walk up and hug their neck. The rest of y'all are like, I don't know about that. I ain't listening to that one. I'm just being honest. That will break down barriers and break down the enemy's attachment in your life. Whatever it is that's holding you back, the bitterness, it will begin to break that wall down. When you see that person that doesn't like you and you just keep doing good for them. It confuses them. It's confusing to them. They don't even understand it. The second thing he says is this. He says, bless those who curse you. You know, not only will people not like you, but they're going to talk about you too. Let me just be real. They're going to talk about it. It's one thing for someone not to like somebody. It's another thing when they start going around and talking about it, right? There, there's, I can't even count on my hand of people that I don't like. There may be one. No, I'm joking. <laughs> because I, I've learned to look past it. I can't live my life not worrying about who I like and don't like. I don't care. If you want to be a part of my team, come on. If you don't, see you later. I've grown up. I'm done with worrying about what you do, what you like, what you don't like. I'm done worrying about what you say about me. So what does the Bible say? When they go around talking about you, what do you do? You bless them. How do you do that? When they come in and say, oh, my gosh, I heard so-and-so. He says they stopped smoking, but I don't believe it. I smell it on them when they walk in. Come on. Y'all are like, what? Well, when so-and-so walks in and they say, man, somebody said that you told me you quit, but this was, you know what? Bless their heart. Bless them. What do you have to say? Bless them. But are you not going to respond? You know they said this about you. Well, I hate they feel that way. Because them feeling that way is obviously them harboring something in their life towards me that I have letting go and I'm walking in freedom. And I hate that they have to continuously spend their time thinking about me when God is so much better. It's not a you problem. Come on, church. You know, when people curse you, people are going to say things about you. Jesus is telling his disciples, look, you're going to do a lot of good in this world. You're going to change a lot of lives. And in the midst of that, there's going to be people that hate you, and there's going to be people that curse you. And we ask, God, why would you let that happen? God, it doesn't make sense. I'm doing good, God, but I try, God, but I'm doing this. But, God, I'm, I'm trying my best. I don't understand it. He's saying, look, this is the reality of a fallen world. There is a spiritual darkness over the lost, and there will be people that don't like you. They will talk about you, and it's not up to you to do the same. Why? Because we're to live different in this world. We're to be different. We're to live different. We're to act different. We're to be something different. The Bible calls us ambassadors, meaning that we represent a different kingdom. Our kingdom is in heaven, and we are just here temporary representing that. So what does our speech say about that kingdom? Do we let earthly things get to us? Do we let earthly people get to us when we need to be worried about that kingdom? 
See, the Bible teaches here that we're to bless those who curse us. When that means people are talking about you, running your mouth, doing whatever, they're running their mouth about you, doing whatever, all you have to do is just look beyond that, look to Jesus, and you just tell them, you know what, I'm sorry they feel that way, but I'm not engaging in this. Because you know what it does when you engage? You put yourself right where that other person is. You start feeling just like they feel. Let me tell you, they're not talking about you just because they hate you. Sometimes, you know the quote, they're talking about you because they ain't you. Come on, somebody. A lot of times, they're just jealous of where you are, so they got to keep talking about it. They're just envious of what God's doing in your life, so they got to keep tearing you down. All they see in their life is this, and they see your life doing like this, so they just can't appreciate it because they're not celebrating with you, so they just want to tear you down. But you know what? Surround yourself with people that celebrate with you, not people that are going to tear you down along the way. Those people are already there. They're already going to be there. Jesus says they're already going to talk about you. They're already going to say these negative things. But the paradox of love is that when we love like Christ love, it doesn't matter what they've done to hate us or what they've done to say about us, but we still love right through that. We press in. We lean in. And honestly, the more they hate me, you know what I do? I love harder. Not because I want them to like me, but I want them to see the God in me. And he loves hard. When we refuse his love, he keeps loving. When we push his love away and we continuously talk about God, God, why? God doesn't come through for me. God doesn't do this. God doesn't do that. When we do these things, his love continues to press in. And that's what we have to do to a lost and dying world. We have to continue to let our love press in. The Bible says also, not only do we bless those who curse us, but we also pray for those who mistreat us. Now, this may be one of the hardest things that anybody in here has to do. Is to pray. Now, that's enough for some of us. To pray. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Right, let's not, to just pray. But then, not only to pray, but to pray for those who have mistreated you. To pray specifically for those that hate you. To pray specifically for those that have talked about you that have ran your name in the ground, that have tried to destroy you, tried to hurt you, for those that may have actually physically hurt you, physically abused you, have mistreated you in such a way that the world could not even comprehend. The hardest thing for us to do in that moment is to pray for that person. Now, let me say this. Your job is not to stay with that person. You hear what I'm saying? If you're in an abusive relationship, if you're in something, let me... Let me clarify real quick if you're in an abusive situation where someone is abusing you and they are actually using this to manipulate you to say well you just need to pray for me no the, you can pray from a distance come on somebody yeah. but I want you to hear this it doesn't eliminate the fact that we have to pray we got to pray we got to pray for those people that have mistreated us that's going to be the hardest. It's easy to sit back with God and say, God, give me this. God, pray for my mom. God, pray for my dad. God, pray for this. God, pray for that. It's hard to say, God, pray. Lord, I lift up that person that hates me. God, I lift up that person that is talking so bad about me that it, it hurts my heart, but I lift them up to you because, God, they're missing something with you. It's not a me problem, it's a them problem, and they're, they're connect, disconnected with you. So, God, I'm going to intercede on their behalf because I know that if you get a hold of their heart, then half of my problems with them go away. <laughs> but, God, I'm going to pray for them. Not because I want my problems to go away, but I genuinely want them to know you. I want them to be changed by you. God, I don't want this to happen to anybody else. I don't want other people to come into their life and them abuse them, them do this, them hurt them, them mistreat them. Lord, I want this to be the last one. God, let me be the last one and change their life. That's what Jesus says. He says we got to pray for those who mistreat us. But that's the hardest thing to do. And you know what the devil does is he tries to get a foothold right here. Because it's so hard to talk about somebody and hate somebody that you're praying for actively. Come on, somebody. If you hate somebody and you're talking about somebody, I'll tell you this. Every time somebody comes in my head to say something negative about and I prayed for that person, God's like, really? What happened to that prayer? 
thought you were praying for their gossip. Now here you are gossiping about them. Maybe you should pray for your gossip. I'm like, thanks, God. But you know what I'm saying. There's, there's moments in, in life where, where we have to pray for these people, the ones that are hurting us, the ones that have mistreated us, the ones that have done these things. It's not up to us to go talk and to hurt and all these things. Our job is to pray for them. That's going to be one of the hardest things you have to do. But here's the biggest question is, okay, we, we understand this, but what do we see from these things? I want us to see two things. Just from this verse, we see, number one, that love is an action. It's not an emotion. I want you to see something about this. There's not one element of this scripture where Jesus is tied to an emotion. There's not one element that says, hey, if you feel good, go do good. Hey, if you like them, bless them. Hey, if they're good to you, pray for them. He doesn't say, hey, when your heart's full, do good. No, what does he say? Do good. Just do good, bless, and pray. Why? Because love is not an emotion, it's an action. We have attributed love so much to this feeling to where if we don't feel it, we don't do it. If I don't feel the love, then I'm not going to participate in it. But God doesn't ever say that love is a feeling. Love is an action and is proven by God sending his son because God himself says, I am the definition of love. And I've sacrificed everything I have for you. That is the definition of love. It's not an emotion. You think God was happy with a humanity that completely ran off the rails and just left him behind and said, we don't need you after he created them? No. The Bible says that we're enemies of God when we're apart from him. Do you think his emotions are happy with it? No. But it didn't stop him from doing, from stepping out of heaven. The Bible says the word became flesh, walked among man, died for your sins. You know, if Jesus did that for us, how much more are we to do that for the world? How much more are we to humble ourselves? Put on the armor of God, the spirit of God, and walk through this dying world and be a representative of him. The problem is we attribute love so highly to an emotion that even in our relationships we're screwed up because we feel like if I don't feel it anymore, then it's time to get divorced. If I don't feel it anymore, it's time to break up. If I don't feel it anymore, you've missed it. It's not up to you to feel it. It's up to you to do it. That's what Jesus says. He says, look, it's not an emotion, church. It's an action. You know what? We showed by action yesterday how much we love God and how much we love people by going out to that park and setting up and giving free stuff away. And I can tell you this right now. None of the staff felt like doing it. (laughs) Am I allowed to be honest in church? But you know what? It's not about us feeling it. It's about us doing what God's called us to do. And he says, you're to be the change in this community, so you need to go and do it, even when you don't feel like it, even when it doesn't meet your schedule, even when it's not working within your child's play periods. Come on, somebody. Even when it's not working within the sleep schedules, even though it's not working here, it's your job to do it. You know, the next thing that we see here is not just that love is an action, not an emotion, but this is one of the biggest things I need you to understand. Love is a command and not a choice. Ooh, some people are like, whoa. Because you know what we've always been told? Love is a feeling, and now this new Christian thing is, well, love's a choice. And I will say this, love is a choice when you're talking about who you want to be intimate with and spend the rest of your life with. That's a choice. Don't make a dumb one. I'm trying to help you here. That's a choice. But you know what's not a choice? To love your neighbor, to love your enemy. Those are commands by God to love. Our job is to love. It's not a choice. The problem is that we have so associated relational love as being a choice, which I believe that. There are times that in your marriage you're going to have to choose to love. There are times in your relationship you're going to have to choose to love. Yes, they may have done this. Yes, it may have hurt. Yes, this may have happened. But do you choose love? That's an option. Here's the other one. When it comes to this, it's not a choice. This is a command. 
The issue is that we have broken it down to this relational choice that even when it comes to God, we think our neighbor and the love we have for them is a choice. If I feel it, God, I'm going to choose to love them. God, if I'm happy today, then I'm going to serve you. God, if, I, if my emotions are intact today, then Lord, I'll pray for them. But you know, all those are acts of love, doing good, blessing, Praying, those are all acts of love. That's an act of love. You don't have to go out of your way to show someone that you love them, but we do need to go out of our way to accept that this is a command and not a choice. When we allow this to be a choice in our lives, we get the opportunity to choose when and when we don't love. When we accept that this is a command from God, then guess what? That's going to drive you in those moments when you say, I don't feel like it. I don't want to. I don't need to. Blah, 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 whatever. And you know what it does is God puts people in your life that when you step out and you do what he's calling you to do, when you do good, when you're actually blessing people, when you're praying for people, when you're operating by this command to love, all of a sudden things start happening around you. Lives are changed because of you. And you don't even understand why. You're like, I'm just doing what God told me to do. That's it. That's it. I want to teach you a couple things here because I'm going to leave you with three quick things. Love is a command, not a choice, but how do we get here? Now, how do we start to love our enemies? Well, the first thing we have to do is to recognize their need for God. If you want to know how to love your enemies, how do we start this process? How do we start this process of blessing and praying and doing good well, the first part is that we have to recognize their need for God. Whose need? Our enemies. You know, our enemy has a need for God. We'll go ahead and call Andy up, and he's going to start closing us out. But we have, a, we have to recognize their need. What is the need? It's God. Look, when someone hates you, it's not because of you. It's because they have something wrong with them and God. There's something blocking their relationship. There's something hindering it. When people are talking about you and cursing you, there's something hindering their relationship with God. When people mistreat you, there's something stopping a relationship with God. So what's our first step in learning to love our enemies is recognizing they need God. The reason they respond this way, the reason they act this way, the reason they do what they do is because they're lacking the love of God in their own heart. And when you recognize that, it allows you to have peace with the love of God in your heart despite what's going on with them. But he says you got to recognize their need for God. Not only do you got to recognize their need for God, but the second thing is you have to forgive them of their humanness. Now I want you to hear that. Forgive them of their humanness. How many of y'all know we're all human? Your pastor's human. You're human. Guess what that means? That comes with something. The Bible says that because of our humanity, we all fall short of the glory of God. Meaning because of our Humanity, Romans says that because of that, we all fall short of God's glory, meaning that none of us are perfect, meaning that all of us in situations, Christian or non-Christian, there's going to come times in our lives where we do something that is in our human nature and not our spiritual nature. And when that happens, when something is done against you, and you feel that pain, you feel that hatred, you're mad at your boss, you're mad at your husband, you're mad at your wife, you feel like they're your enemy, they're not your enemy, the devil's your enemy. But when you start attributing these people as your, as your earthly enemies, no, he says this. He says you have to forgive them of their humanness. Recognize they're human. You know, we take things so personal. We're like, they meant this against me. No, they didn't. They're human. They messed up. If someone knew of every single thing you ever did or ever said, you know, somebody just opened the page of your book and they caught you at a bad story. Sometimes you might have just opened a page of somebody else's book and you caught them at a bad story. And when that happens, you need to forgive them of their humanness and recognize, you know what? I have the same problem. I'm human too. 
you know what, I fly off the handle. I get mad. I do these things. I, I need to forgive them in this moment. Because the only way to lead with love is to forgive them of their humanness. I need to recognize their need for God. Forgive them of their humanness. And here's the last part. Pray that they turn to God. The last part is you pray that they turn to God. Why? Because we know that the only way they're going to experience true freedom and true healing in their life is that they turn to God. So what better than to have people that have access to a heavenly father to intercede on behalf of the lost and dying world? Isn't that the Bible? Come on, isn't that what Jesus says? That we need to be praying, interceding, doing good, do these things for a lost and dying. When we recognize, we recognize these people, man, they have a need for God. That's why they're doing this. They have such a desperate need to feel his love, to feel his grace, to feel his mercy. They're operating out of pain. They're operating out of hurt. And hurting people, they hurt people. So what do we do? We need to be on our hands and our knees praying for these people that are lost. Why? Because it doesn't just affect our lives. It affects others. It affects the next generation. It affects the kids coming up. It affects whoever, who's next in line. It affects all of us. So what do we do? We pray. What do we pray for? We pray that they know God. Why? It doesn't matter how many times they come to this church. We could pray for them to come here. We could pray for them to go to another church. We could pray for them to go to a revival. We can pray for them for what? But until they come to Jesus, it doesn't matter. If you don't know this by now, it's not about Village Church. It's about Jesus. Yes, I want people here, but I'm not going to just continuously invite people. I'm going to start praying for them that God would just get a hold of their heart. Because I don't care if they come here or if they go somewhere else. I want to see them in heaven. But our job is to pray for them. Who do you need to pray for today? Who do you need to forgive today? Who is it the next time you see them, you need to walk up and just hug their neck? Maybe you need to say, you know what, I'm sorry. You know what, my humanness got in the way. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians. This is what identifies love. It says this, this is the attributes. It says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always loves, or always perseveres. Love never fails. That's the definition of love. That's the attributes of God in this world. And you know what? When we're to live like God and lead with love, this is how we do it. It's with these things right here. Some of you today, man, you need to start leading with love. There's some things in your life. Maybe you're the one that you, maybe you, you curse people. Maybe you're the one that has an issue with doing good. Maybe you're the one that's hating people. You know what? God gives you an opportunity. God gives you an opportunity right now to confess your sins and say, God, I'm a sinner. Maybe you struggle with the love of God. If you're honest, that's it. That's the reason I talk about. That's the reason I do this. That's the reason because I struggle with God's love in my own life. So I look at everybody else and I'm mad because I feel like God's not doing it for me. You know what? You should be on your hands and knees crying out to God saying, hey, God, I'm a sinner. Please save my soul. And guess what he'll do? He'll pick you up. He'll dust you off. He'll put you on the right path. And next thing you know, your life will be different. You won't be cursing people anymore. You won't live with that hatred in your heart. There'll be a love that is patient, that is kind, that doesn't envy, that doesn't boast. There's going to be love inside of you that changes you and changes those around you. Maybe you're in here today and you say, man, I need that. You know, there's a time in my life that I had to say, God, I need you. There's going to come a time in all of our lives that we have to make that decision. God, yes, I'm going to live for you. Or God, no, I'm not. 
And this is one of those moments where he offers an opportunity for you in here to say, God, yes, I'm going to live for you. God, I haven't been living right. And today is the day that I, I'm going to dedicate my life to you. If you would bow your head, close your eyes. Maybe you're in here and you say, that's me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want you to know this. God loves you. Maybe that's you in here. I just want to pray for you. If you'd slip your hand up, you say, I want to give my life to Jesus today. I've, I've been talking to him. Amen. Anybody in here? You say, I've been talking to him. Today's the day. I'm tired of living in sin. Amen. I see you. I'm surrendering my life. I want you to know God loves you. Amen. I see you. I, God loves you. God cares about you. The decision you made in your heart, God knows it. I'm going to lift you up right now, Father, for the ones that raise their hands. God, saying that today is the day, Lord, I'm going to experience that love. I'm going to walk in freedom with you. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in their hearts. God, we ask that you would lead people to their next steps and believers baptism. Knowing that, Father, once we accept you in our heart, Lord, it's up to us to go tell the world that we've done that. Father, for the rest of the church in here right now, Lord, I just pray over every need. I just pray over everything that's going on in their lives. Lord, whoever's coming against them, whoever's hating them, whoever's persecuting them, whoever's cursing them, Father, whoever's mistreating them, Father, we come against them in the name of Jesus. But, Father, we ask that their hearts are turned to you, that they experience your love. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody needs prayer, feel free to stand up. We have some people in the back ready to pray for you.